the sentence, all cats are black, is evidently untrue, even if only one cat in the whole universe were to be white. Thus the property being black cannot form a part of the definition of a cat. The lesson to be learned is that definitions must be universal. They must apply to all the members of a defined set, the set of all cats in our example. Let us try to define a chair. In doing so, we are trying to capture the essence of being a chair, its chairness. It is chairness that is being defined, not this or that specific chair. We want to be able to identify chairness whenever or wherever we come across it. But chairness cannot be captured without somehow tackling and including the uses of a chair. What is it made for? What does it do or help to do? In other words, a definition must include an operative part, a function. In many cases, the function of the definiendum, the term defined, constitutes its meaning. There is no difference between essence and function. The function of a vinyl record, for instance, is its meaning. It has no meaning outside its function. The definients, the expression supplying the definition of a vinyl record, both encompasses and consists of its function or use. Yet, can a vinyl record be defined in vacuum without incorporating the record player in, in the definients? After all, a vinyl record is an object containing audio information recorded by a record player. Without the record player bit, the definients becomes ambiguous. It can fit an audio cassette or a compact disc. So the context is essential. A good definition includes a context, which serves to alleviate ambiguity. Ostensibly, the more details provided in the definition, the less ambiguous it becomes. But this is not true. Actually, the more details provided, the more prone is the definition to be ambiguous. A definition must strive to be both minimal and aesthetic. In this sense, it is much like a scientific theory or an equation. It talks about the match or the correlation between language and reality. Reality is parsimonious, and to reflect it, definitions must be as parsimonious as reality is. Let us summarize the characteristics of a good definition and then apply them and try to define a few very mundane terms. First, the definition must reveal the meaning of the term or concept defined. By meaning, I mean the independent and invariant meaning, not the culturally dependent, narrative-derived type of meaning. The invariant meaning has to do with a function or a use. A term or a concept can have several uses or functions, even conflicting ones. But all the uses and functions must be universally recognized. Think about marijuana or tobacco. They have medical uses and recreational uses. These uses are expressly contradictory, but both are universally acknowledged. So both define the meaning of marijuana or tobacco and form a part of their definitions. Let us try to construct the first indisputable functional part of the definitions of a few terms. Chair, intended for sitting. Game, deals with the accomplishment of goals. Window, allows to look through it, or for the penetration of light or air when open or not covered. Table, intended, intended for laying things on its surface. It is only when we know the function or use of the definiendum that we can begin to look for it. The function use filters the world and narrows the set of candidates to the definiendum. A definition is a series of superimposed language filters. Only the definiendum can penetrate this lineup of filters. It is like a high specificity membrane. Only one term can slip through and slip in. So the next parameter to look for is the characteristics of the definiendum. In the case of physical objects, we'll be looking for physical characteristics, of course. Otherwise, we'll be looking for more ephemeral, abstract ones and traits. So chair, the physical object. It is a solid structure intended for sitting. Now we have two things, a physical characteristic or trait 
and a function. Game is a mental or physical activity of one or more people, the players, which deals with the accomplishment of goals. A window is a planar, planar discontinuity in a solid surface, which allows to look through it or for the penetration of light or air when open or not covered. A table is a structure with at least one leg and one flat surface intended for laying things on it. A contrast begins to emerge between the rigorous dictionary language lexical definition and a stipulative definition, explaining how the term is to be used. The first might not be immediately recognizable, the second may be inaccurate, non-universal, and otherwise lacking. Every definition contrasts the general to the particular. The first part of the definience is almost always the genus, the wider class to which the term belongs. It is only as we refine the definition, narrow it down, that we introduce the differentia, the distinguishing features. A good definition allows for the substitution of the defined by its definition. A bit awkward if we are trying to define God, for instance, or love, but still a rule of thumb. This would be impossible without a union of the general and the particular. A case could be made that the genus is more lexical, while the differentia are more stipulative. But whatever the case, a definition must include a genus and a differentia, because, as we said, it is bound to reflect reality, and reality is hierarchical and inclusive. The Matryushka doll principle, if you wish. So, coming back again to our definitions. Chair. A solid structure intended for sitting would be the genus. Makes use of at least one bodily axis of the sitter would be differentia. Without the differentia, with the genus alone, the definition can well fit a bed or a divan. Again, mental or physical activity of one or more people, the players, which deals with the accomplishment of goals, that would be the genus, in which both the activities and the goals accomplished are reversible, that would be the differentia. Without the differentia, with the genus alone, the defin this definition can fit most other human activities. Window. A planar discontinuity in a solid surface, that would be the genus, which allows to look through it, or for the penetration of light or air, when open or covered, and these are the differentia. Without the differentia, with the genus alone, this definition can fit a door. Table. A structure with at least one leg and one flat surface, and that's the genus. Intended for laying things on its surface, and that's the differentia. Without the differentia, with the genus alone, the definition can well fit the statue of a one-legged soldier holding a tray. It was Locke who realized that there are words whose meaning can be precisely explained, but which cannot be defined in this sense. This is either because the explanatory equivalent may require more than genus and differentia, or because some words cannot be defined by means of other words, because those other words also have to be defined, and this leads to an infinite regression. If we adopt the broad view that the definition is the explanation of meaning by other words, how can we define, for instance, blue? Only by pointing out examples of blue. Thus, names of elementary ideas, colors, for instance, cannot be defined by words. They require an ostensive definition definition by pointing out examples. This is because elementary concepts apply to our experiences, notions, sensations, impressions, and to sensor, sense data. These are usually words in a private language, our private language. How does one communicate, let alone define, the emotion one experiences during an epiphany? On the contrary, dictionary definitions suffer from gross inaccuracies precisely because they are confined to established meanings not to private ones. They usually include in the definition things that they should have excluded, and exclude things that they should have included, or get, or get it altogether wrong. Stipulative or ostensive definitions cannot be wrong by definition. They may conflict with lexical dictionary definitions and diverge from established meanings. And this may, be, may prove to be both confusing and costly, for instance, in legal methods. But this has nothing to do with their accuracy or truthfulness. They still would be accurate and truthful, even if they cannot be communicated effectively. Additionally, both types of definition may be insufficiently explanatory. They may be circular or obscure, tautological, 
leaving more than one possibility open, vigorous, equivocal, and so on. Many of these problems are solved when we introduce context to the definition. Context has four conceptual pillars, time, place, cultural context, and mental context, or mental characteristics. A definition which is able to incorporate all four elements is monovalent, unequivocal, unambiguous, precise, universal, appropriately exclusive and inclusive, aesthetic, and parsimonious. Let's try again. Chair. Artificial, that's the context, solid structure intended for sitting, genus, makes use of at least one bodily axis of the sitter, differentia, and without the context, the definition can well fit an appropriately shaped rock. Game. Mental or physical activity of one or more people, the players, subject to agreed rules of confrontation, collaboration and scoring, the context, which deals with the accomplishment of goals, genus, in which both the activities and the goals accomplished are reversible, differentiate. This time, without the context, the definition can well fit most other non-play human activities. Window. A planar discontinuity in a solid, artificial context, surface, genus, which allows to look through it or for the penetration of light or air when not covered or open, differentiate. Without the context, the definition can well fit a hole in a rock. It is easy to notice that the distinction between the differentia and the context is rather blurred. Many of the differentia are the result of cultural and historical context. A lot of the context emerges from this critical mass of differentia. We have confined our discussion hitherto to the structural elements of a definition. But the definition is a dynamic process. It involves the sentence doing the defining, the process of defining, and the resulting defining expression, the definience. This interaction between different definitions of definitions gives rise to numerous forms of equivalence. So this interaction between different definitions of definition give rise, gives rise to numerous forms of equivalence, all of them called definitions. Real definitions, nominal definitions, prescriptive, contextual, recursive, inductive, persuasive, in predict in predicative, extensional and intentional definitions, all these are stars in the firmament in the galaxy of alternative modes of explanation. But it all boils down to the same truth. It is the type of definition chosen and the rigorousness with which we understand the meaning of definition that determine which words can and cannot be defined. In my view, there is still a mistaken belief that there are terms which can be defined without going outside a specified realm, a set of terms. People are trying to define life or love by resorting to chemical reactions. This reductionism inevitably and invariably leads to the Locke paradoxes. It is true that a definition must include all the necessary conditions to the definiendum. Chemical reactions are a necessary condition to life, but they are not a sufficient condition. A definition must include all the sufficient conditions as well. Now, can we try to define definition itself? Let's try. Definition is a statement which captures the meaning, the use, the function, and the essence of a term or a concept. Back to square one.